Okay. Well, I have an offer. 
Doctor, always appreciate you listening to my audio recordings and my stuff. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. 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 I'm just wondering whether I might dare break the frontier. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're saying like whoever comes in last is uh, here in the minutes. And I don't know. I, I think that they were actually in the group before you. You were kind of like ran past them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, <laughs> you didn't wear your red shirt. Uh, Yoko Hamish? It's time, right? Okay, so we're still waiting on a minute taker. <laughs> a Richard volunteer. Richard's doing it. Thank you. <laughs> that was funny. I got enough enjoyment out of it that I'll take the minutes. <laughs> It'd be awesome if you could both take notes and collaborate. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, by now, uh, hopefully, since this is the second session you've probably been in, at least today, <laughs> note well. Uh, please note the note well, as we will be using it. And the agenda. For bashing, the this was posted a couple weeks ago. Uh, since it was posted, uh, Martin asked for a chunk of the time allows uh, section. So, if we're expeditious with the other, uh, we'll get to hear about uh, the emergency services work. Any agenda bashing? Okay. Uh, then we'll start with the CERT delegation. Was like Yoda the last speaker? <laughs> okay. Is that working? Okay, I think that's good. Uh, hi, I'm John. We're going to talk about certificate delegation, and I have engineered my deck this time so it will not eat the entire session as it did last time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what is this? This is a working group item on certificate delegation, and it sets out to explain 
exactly how delegation works. I mean, there's some language in ADQ 26 that says you can like create delegations and then you can have like child certs off of parent certs and they can inherit some of the permissions that these parent certs possessed, but it didn't really spell out much of the mechanics of what that meant to have like an AS and VS deal with certificates like that. So this is really just trying to explain something we hinted at in ADQ 26, but didn't actually explain. Um, we also wanted to talk a bit about how it interacted with Acme since we're doing a lot of Acme stuff in general around STIR. It's not a long draft and you can probably read it by the time uh, this talk is done if you haven't read it before. Um, but it does support a number of interesting use cases. Probably the ones that get the most attention in the industry are enterprise and OTT cases, cases where there are entities that are kind of pseudo carriers that maybe have enough SIP infrastructure that they wanna be able to sign calls themselves. But in the traditional shaken model, they don't show up as carriers. They don't look like carriers like NECA and the people who decide who gets operating carrier numbers traditionally in the United States. And so we wanted to try to figure out if there was a use for doing delegation to kind of help those entities get into the stir shaken ecosystem. Um, this could work as well for like end userish cases. One common one that comes up is like the doctor's office case where the doctor wants to be able to like spoof the main number of a medical facility from his cell phone and maybe an individual cert could be kind of delegated to his phone or something that would let him do it. There's like possibilities for that, but that's not really what we're talking about at this point. Next slide. Sorry, the blue sheets are going around a second time because a bunch of people came in after they went around the first time. All right, uh, changes since last time, and this reflects the interim meeting that uh, we had over that lovely teleconference um, two or so months ago. We talked a bit about the need to articulate better how TN off list permissions worked, because this is actually apparently something we weren't super clear about in 8226. And I guess we're using this document as a place to make sure we explain what it, what the hell it's supposed to mean if you actually have OCNs and telephone numbers in a bucket in a single certificate. And based on the design from long, long ago that uh, Russ helped out with back in the day, uh, permissions are additive. What that means is like, you know, if a certificate contains two OCNs, what that doesn't mean is it's the intersection of the telephone numbers that they support um, that this, this particular certificate is authorized to sign for. It is the superset of all the telephone numbers covered by those two OCNs. And similarly, if you have uh, heterogeneous resources like an OCN and a telephone number range, it's not saying like within this OCN, you can sign this telephone number range. Instead, it's saying, you know, you can sign for anything that's under this OCN and anything under this telephone number range, even if they are kind of overlapping. Uh, so we just wanted to make that clear. I guess this is where we're gonna end up making that clarification. Added a bit more text about uh, collapsing the certificate chain in cases where the CA that issued a parent cert, a parent wants to delegate down to um, you know a, a new delegate certificate uh, for an enterprise or whatever, but really that you know the 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 carrier, let's say, who uh, controls that parent cert is going to the same CA to get the delegate cert issued that issued them their own CA, uh, their own certificate. In that case, there may be ways to collapse the certificate chain. So I kind of explained that a bit more. There is a bit of a trade-off in that, in that you may discard information about who the entity was that issued the initial cert in the first place. So we'd have to, you know, figure out some way to make sure that the resulting collapsed chain cert actually correctly identifies who the parent is. But um, there's been some interest in this rather than having like these sprawling chains of certificates that could potentially in uh, aberrant use cases arise from delegation. And finally, I added a bit of language on subserts. This was a TBD that we discussed a bit last time and I think we spent quite a bit of time on it actually. Um, and kind of what the draft does now is say, we'll get to that if we need it. In other words, okay, we're defining a delegation system here, but there could be some regulatory environment, you know, maybe if Germany wakes up tomorrow and decides we're gonna do STIR, they may not like the idea of issuing certificates to carriers with CA equals true in it. And so it just kind of leaves the door open to, okay, if it turns out that is gonna be possible in some regulatory environments, we should at least know that there is a plan for how to deal with that in those cases. Next slide. Um, more stuff left over from last meeting. I did uh, just restrict pretty much using X5U since everyone's using X5U and I understand there's already like PEM chains in X5U. Um, we could use X5C because it's designed for the specific purpose in, um, in JOT, but um, 
you know, if people want to start doing it, that's fine. Right now, pretty much everyone is using X5U though, so I would probably stick with that. We had a big discussion last time about the good bit about the idea that maybe we should put some piece of markup in the certificate that says that the entity, the CA that issued the cert, um, did the vetting process to make sure that the encompassing semantics had actually been validated before it issued the delegate cert. But as many people pointed out, like it should just do that and there shouldn't be any need for you to say there has to be a good bit to say that you just did that. Instead, we're just assuming you did that. So a uh, point on that is if there is a certificate policy under which the certificate is issued, that is where you explicitly say it, not in the cert. Fair enough, fair enough. And so uh, we're, we're no longer talking about good bits for that. Um, this does not however preclude if you are a VS and you still wanna just double check that this particular telephone number is within the scope of the OCN and the cert that signed it. You can still do that. We're not forbidding you from doing it. We're just saying that's kind of belt and suspenders at this point because that uh, delegation should have been assured by the CA that issued the cert in the first place. Um, and for now, I, I didn't really do anything about Acme Star. I think we're gonna push that probably into the short-lived certs draft if we get around to doing that, which um, we, we probably will at some point. If we have any spare time today, we may talk about what future directions will be for work we're gonna explore here. Um, but for now, I'm not really saying anything about it in this draft. Next slide. That's it. Like, I'm, I'm not here to raise any issues. I'm not really aware there are any issues. Um, I think we, we still are kind of waiting to see what Addis is going to emit from the process it's going through right now to kind of measure ways that enterprises and OTTs might participate in the shaken ecosystem. And I think once we have something more concrete from that, uh, there, there may be just corrections, course corrections that are required in this approach. But I think this, you know, for that reason, we may hold it another cycle, um, not advance it just yet. Maybe we could use that time to get some eyes on it and see if anybody has any comments. But as far as I'm concerned, basically this should be ready to advance. This was never intended to be a particularly complicated draft, just trying to explain what we meant by saying delegation was possible when we wrote RFC 8226. So point of clarification there, are you suggesting we do working group last call now and be ready, or are you saying wait a cycle and then do working group last call? I mean, you could go either way. I don't, I don't have strong feelings about that. I mean, you know, working group last calls are two weeks and cycles are like four months. Right. So I don't think it is essential that we uh, do that immediately. But we certainly could if that'll help get some eyes and review on it. That's what the point was, is uh, that usually is a forcing function to get people to actually read it. So maybe after Christmas. Yeah, that seems yeah. good. Hey, anybody here read it, have any thoughts about it? think this is the right, wrong approach. You know, it's not really any different from the last two times I presented this. Okay, I see some thumbs up. I see some, I see one guy with a pitchfork, but. Chris went, a uh, few of us are implementing it, so. Yeah, it is, it is I mean, being implemented. I, I understand that, that people are kicking the tires on this in the marketplace, like I said. So this is not exactly um, science fiction stuff. This is, and again, it is, it is in 8226 that you can do this. <laughs> it is in some RFC we previously published. This is just really for the people who are now trying to implement explaining what it means to implement it. So, okay. I believe that is it on this. There's nothing, the backup means backup. You know, and, and I, I'm glad we got through that quick because now we have plenty of time to spend on RCD, unlike last time. <laughs> the funny part is uh, we spent a lot of time at the interim on RCD, so I think we actually covered most of it, but I'll give an update. I think there is a couple of topics we can talk about in more depth. So actually, really, the first slide is most critical. I have examples and other the things. The first slide? Or sorry, the <laughs> second, <laughs> second, <laughs> second slide. <laughs> so for the most part, um, you know, between the, the interim meeting and um, the new draft, I 
you know, took all the decisions we made and tried to incorporate all those in the draft. Um, the big one was, and, and you know, the one that we probably spent the most conversation on was sort of trying to figure out what the normative language is about like operating in different modes. Um, and I think we came up with essentially three modes, which I detail in the draft. So the first one is, you know, nothing about integrity. We're just signing direct content into the claims. Like you're directly incorporating a J card, for example, with, and there's no URIs or anything like that. Uh, the second one is if any of the content in the RCD claims does have any URLs, then you must sign with an integrity claim digest. So um, if anybody's new to that, it's a digest over the content that the URLs point to. There's a, there's a serialization mechanism that tells you which order to do the URLs and insert the content into the digest and all that other stuff. Um, and then the third one is uh, the case where, you know, you might have some non-authoritative users signing. Um, so you want to use some mechanisms that are built into 8226 certificates um, to and essentially say you must use this integrity digest um, in signing it so that you know when the when the call is initiated and the RCD contents incorporated um, you know it it's tied back to wow. the the JWTT constraints that were in put into the um, into the certificate itself and I guess I forget if I put a must there but um, I guess it wouldn't be a must. It's if you have that scenario, if you have that use case, then you use that technique. Um, the other big topic, any questions on that? Ho hopefully I captured it, uh, how we discussed it. Um, okay. The next um, major topic is uh, we talked about... Um, you know, for a couple of reasons, like compact form and alignment with other, you know, just plain old SIP uh, mechanisms of using call info, um, we wanted to um, create a new um, call info purpose, I think is the verb that I sort of read out of that of J card. So in other words, add to the currently defined, I think it's info, icon, and card, which card really means V card in that case. So we wanted to create one that was specific to RCD um, with the purpose of J card. Um, so I submitted that draft. Um, you know, there's the basic, you know, description of what we're using it for, things like that. I also went through and I incorporated, um, I thought maybe it was a good idea to explain, you know, and maybe have some normative things around which properties of J card should be used. Um, I'm curious what people think about that. I'm actually thinking that instead of um, in this SIP core draft, it might be good actually to keep that in the stir RCD draft because, you know, other people might have other opinions for what, you know, the, the uses of J card are for SIP for other applications or, or things like that. So I, I, I was more targeting, you know, interoperability where terminals may want to display certain logos in certain ways, you know, icons should be certain sizes, you know, I, I, I didn't know how far to go there. So I'm just curious if anybody has any feedback about how far we should go with that. You know, is that just going to be a, a rat hole or um, is that something we should do? Or should we just do that from an industry perspective, independent of IETF? I could see that as a solution as well. Sounds like a great opportunity for bike shedding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So I sent a message to the SIP core mailing list. Um, 
Um, and we can discuss it there, but I'm thinking like keeping it as simple as possible is probably the best policy there. Um, I also gave some details about compact form, you know, explicitly using this call info J card. Um, and then also a display name for the um, for the uh, name claim that's in uh, RCD. Um, and I removed, as we discussed, um, the other call info tokens because we just wanted to focus on JCARD and keep it simple there as well. And that's the major changes. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or comments about that. Um, one thing, you know, looking deeper into call info, um, call info uses a URI as the the parameter right after. So there's a question of, you know, <clears throat> it's probably the case that we want to incorporate this info, like a JCARD info, directly in the invite somehow. Um, and John and I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but he mentioned there's some hacks that may be putting in the body or something like that, so. Uh, John Peterson, so everybody who knows me knows that my favorite thing in life is the data URL. And that, <laughs> this is a, it's a joke, it's like the thing I think is the most architecturally sloppy use of URLs in the history of the universe. But there, there are lots of ways to actually just encode bodies, right, that you can insert them into SIP requests. And there's a specific kind of, um, uh, my media type for CID, which indicates that you're actually pointing to a body that exists like elsewhere in the SIP message. Now, I mean, all these CID uses require my multipart. And in the past, my multipart support has been a bit spotty in SIP implementations. So, I mean, that that's not a fantastic solution. I still think did URLs are a worse solution. Probably if we had to pick something based on the way that we have dealt with these things lately, it would be just encoding it in a header, right? <laughs> like the entire thing, like, mm -hmm. you know, is, is it a base 64 parameter that we tack on to call info itself that contains the entire J card? Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that everyone who's thrilled about the size of identity headers will be, you know, very excited to see what that <laughs> will happen when you have logos and icons, like, you know, being base 64 encoded in these things. But, um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, I think you do have to bite the bullet on if you are going to have these things incorporate um, large objects like JPEGs that are like 64K, they're, they're going to be in by reference. There's just not. Right. Any, and I, I think that would be secondary anyways, because it would be, you know, the logo property of a, of a J card anyways. So, I mean, provided that we are not proposing to actually encode those things, probably we can have a profile of J card, which we wouldn't specify in this call info document. We specify in the RCD document, right. right? That would say, well, here's here's a kind of minimal representation that gets you what you want, specifies these URLs that you can code that and stick it into a parameter or a header in SIP. Um, it won't be too much worse than, you know, your passports already are. Right. So, I mean, that's, yeah, the, the alternatives are we figure out some way to hack it into the header, we stick it in a mind body, um, you know, we use a data URL, we're not, we're not using a goddamn data URL. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, Brian Rosen, this is probably not what you want, but I'll just make you aware that for the emergency call services, we created a, a, um, thing called additional data, which can hold a, currently it's an X card, but we want to make a J card version of that anyway, so we would help you do that. Mm -hmm. um, we do allow uh, direct in the body or URI indirect, but that that thing exists if you wanted to use it. Hmm? Call info. Call info. The other thing is I, di I didn't get a chance to ask, um, I see how is online, um, whether that's, if that's addressed in EC name or not, um, if she wants to comment now or I can ask offline. Um, I'd be a little curious there too. Um, the other, um, 
topic. So yeah, no, no further comments on that. Everybody's sort of happy with us going down that rabbit hole. Um, okay. <laughs> I took it as you can go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the other one um, is a topic um, I've gotten the request and I've seen it actually used in the industry where um, people are putting things like call reason um, and some other things that are maybe more specific to the call versus specific to the caller. Um, and, you know, the first instinct was, oh, let's just stuff it all in RCD. Um, but I think we want to sort of purposefully think about, you know, things that are related to caller versus, uh, um, you know, information that's part of the call. I know Henning has a call info thing that's related to like typing the caller and or you know like what side of the fence is that on. Um, so just curious if people have opinions on um, on that topic. Do you have, I'm, are you uh, going going back to the? No, I I we I have something from the Jabber room. Yeah. Uh, Hala asks, what is not addressed in eCNAM? I don't know. That was my question to Hala. I didn't get a chance to take a look at the draft, but the question is, are are the are all the if I believe it's using call info, and I guess the question is, you know, are they all externally referenced data, or is there some way that the data has actually been incorporated into the header or not? Yeah, John, John Peterson again. Yeah, it's um. You know, to the degree that ECNAM like incorporates things like logos, like how's it do it, and in particular, how's the whole structure that like you know the URLs to logos and so on exist in, encoded in call info, right? I think that's right. that's the question, and this this is an attempt to look, really just look at what the encoding structure should be for this, and it would be great if this is a point where we could actually be aligned just on the encoding structure. Yeah, just looking to see if that problem has already been addressed somewhere else than you know. Um, or, it, I mean, if it's just using standard call info, then that's fine too. I mean, the the thing Brian was talking about, the additional info, that actually sounds pretty promising, probably. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at it. But um, yeah, I am really interested in this this question of what call info really means and what JCard really means. Because like, JCard is just vCard, right? And vCard is a way that you describe someone's like contact information and related stuff about who a person is. And like there does seem to be a fundamental distinction between like the function of card and the function of, you know, things like reason, which are not about who this entity is that is placed in the call. It's really that's more like caller info at the end of the day, like the stuff that's in card. When right. you get into what the call reason is, I, I think it it could potentially be an entirely separate, a component of an entirely separate data structure. There are a couple other examples of things that work along these lines that I can think of. One of them is um, URLs for um, uh, outs you know, interacting outside the call, um, usually post-call interaction is the kind of thing that, you know, like an enterprise want to be able to deliver to an end user so that they can like, click a URL after a call or even if they didn't answer the call. And um, those things aren't like JCard or, you know, vCard. Um, they're something that is specific to who that particular entity is that, and, and really what the call was about. And that seems to be the same for uh, call reason. So just architecturally, I think both of these things can fall within the scope of RC date, of rich call data. A component of rich call data is who is this joker who is placing this call? And all the things that are kind of jcard-ish will help answer that component of it. It just could be there's a need for a separate data structure, I think, that it would still be under the RCD rubric, but would cover things like call reason. Um, that do just seem to be kind of like architecturally separate. I mean, it, can, it would just seem like weird to hack JCard for like call reason, right? Because mm -hmm. like it's JCard is like, you know, supposed to tell you who this person is. <laughs> it's not supposed to tell you like, you know, why they're calling. Um, it's not, I think, supposed to be dynamic that way. <clears throat> but, you know, this, this, if anybody else has any views about whether kind of vCard is, should be extensible to this? Is it more dynamic than I think it is? And I've just kind of missed this over the years, or does it make sense to have this kind of separation between what, um, you know, who with the, the caller info and the call info? 
uh, Brian Rosen channeling the Hala at, in the Jabber room. The info parameter delivers plain text metadata, but utilizes the data URL scheme of RFC 2397 to include the CNAME plus information in the call info header info parameter. Being a terminating service, we don't have the same concerns on hacking. Right. So, Colin Jennings, um, just discussing what John was on, talking about there with the vCard. vCard was designed that all of the data in it was mergeable in other things. So it was persistent and savable. And putting mm -hmm. this type of information in vCard would break the mergeable semantics of vCard. So, I mean, I totally support it being in something separate. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't map to the, I mean, it'll be a problem if you try and stuff it right. in vCard. I don't know enough about jCard, but presumably those same it, problems it, map It's over. just a direct mapping. Yeah, it, it's just a JSON version. Um, the other thing I was going to bring up too is like I can see definite use cases of, you know, especially thinking about the integrity stuff. Um, you know, the the person, the person or the company or whatever never changes, but you know the reason for the call does change, and so you may want even separation of the integrity part as well. So we might want to think about that as well. Yeah, I, I, John Peterson again. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think. One thing I would be interested in knowing is if anybody thinks we there's anything we can steal for this. Like, is there something out there already that communicates roughly what call info means versus what caller info means? That, and I'm not sure there would be in the ITF, but maybe like outside the ITF. I mean, is there something in like some like Etsy Typhon? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what it is, but like somewhere that someone has actually looked at, um, you know, metadata that's associated with the call that's intended to convey things like reason. Um, but in an extensible data structure that we could just incorporate into this the same way we're just stealing J card. Because if not, we're going to have to hack it ourselves. That's my point. Right. And like, you know. Reason or intent would be another phrase. Reason, that intent. You... But like I said, it's it's going to include things like your URL for post-call interaction. There's going to be like a bunch of stuff that we're going to be able to put into that. And uh, so it'd have to be something that's relatively extensible. Anybody have any ideas? CDRs, that's not bad. What we found, yeah, what do you have in CDRs? Um, I mean, probably not things that were intended for display to the called party. I think that's, yeah, not, not URLs for post-call interactions, but there might be some things in there like it. Um, I don't know. Well, if anybody thinks of anything, like let us know, because otherwise, pretty much, we're gonna have to like make something new for this. I mean, it probably has to be something where, you know, obviously we want to support at a minimum text, but then, you know, it may be an image, it may be other things as well. So that's probably along the lines of what we want as an extensible object that can have different. Um, definitions of keys with specific purposes and then the media, whether it's text or images or, or whatever. Um, but we don't want to go to like HTML or anything like that, I would assume. <laughs> or maybe we do, I don't know. Okay, um, I think that was all the topics I wanted to talk about today. So thank you. Okay, John, I think you're going to talk about the uh, OOB. Nice. These ones are quick, too. We're actually making good progress getting through this. We're totally not going over. We totally don't need an interim meeting to follow this. This is fantastic. <laughs> next, next slide. This is really just saying what has transpired with these two documents since they escaped the working group. Our benevolent overlord, uh, Mr. Roach, took a hard look at the divert and OOB documents, um, got some very handy nits in OOB, and uh, some more serious things in DIB, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but in addition to Adam's comments, actually, as more people have been looking at OOB, and this is kind of like a thing now, turns out, um, one piece of feedback that I've gotten loud and clear is there needed to be more text about mitigation for this callback uh, service substitution attack, which is detailed in the document now. This is a case where an OOB, right, where, you know, if a call is coming in to a target and you want to try to impersonate a call to a target, um, if you as the attacker have some way of predicting 
that like an enterprise you want to impersonate is already placing a call to the person that you want to impersonate them to. Um, you can like do a race condition against them, right? And if your call wins, then when the called party's phone rings, they'll go talk to the CPS where passports are stored in the out-of-band model. They'll get this passport that tells them, oh, a call exactly like your, looks just like your call is actually in progress at the moment. Fantastic. And so I know that it must be you. Um, I think this is an extremely difficult attack to practically um, execute. The only conditions under which it seems remotely plausible are callback services. These are cases where if you imagine a big enterprise like American Express or something has a number that you, or maybe even a web page that you can put in and say, hey, you know, please call me, have an agent call me at the following number. And if you, you know, you're an attacker and you did like 10,000 practice calls and timed them against a random selection of numbers that you control and got a good sense of exactly how long it took for their callback service to like emit a call, maybe then I could predict, right? Um, when I'm doing the callback uh, to Adam, then I could, you know, put Adam's number in to American Express's webpage, say, call me, wait 1.37 seconds, launch my call and beat American Express's call to Adam at just the time American Express provisioned their passport to the CPS. Um, so we put in some more text about mitigation for that. There are a couple of ways to mitigate it. The main ones are reducing the window in which the passport is actually available in the CPS, including potentially putting it in after you place the call. Um, the text is said for some time, um, you know, first you put your passport in CPS and then you place your call. And you can reduce the window on that side and also, um, the other thing it talks about is doing some kind of post-call coordination. And this is based on the exposure of call state information on both sides of the call. And what this requires really is that the enterprise, if it calls and and the uh, Android phone says, hey, I'm connected, and the enterprise says, I'm not connected, I, I got a busy signal, or I got sent a voicemail, um, then you know that there's shenanigans, that somebody won the race condition. And if you're super paranoid about this, then you can implement things like that. What would be much simpler to implement is a random timer that gives you about two seconds of leeway and how long your callback service takes to execute its calls. You did that on the enterprises at, at you know, a hundredth of the expense of implementing any other things that I just described, you would make this attack impossible. Um, but that much said, we have some more mitigation stuff about that in there. And we'll, we're getting some preliminary data even about how common um, predictable callback services really are. I, I don't think they're actually very common. In my experience, most callback services um, already have 30 seconds worth of like random delay to them just because of human interactions and, and things like that. But there's some text in there to make those people feel better. Um, we also added some text about discovering a CPS through provisioning as opposed to having some kind of service discovery function because in a lot of the toy implementations of OOB that are out there today, they're happening in more closed environments, right? They're happening in these more enterprise-ish environments. And as a consequence of that, you really can just provision, well, this is my CPS. You don't need to figure out who the CPS is for a caller that you have no pre-association with. You're doing this in a much more constrained environment. Um, so those have been added in addition to the nits that Adam pointed out that I very much appreciate. Next slide. On div, so I fixed the exam, oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, just one quick question. So I, I assume when you mean provision, you mean that CPS is protected as well in terms of access or? Yeah, these, this would be, I mean, effectively in those cases, the CPS would probably authenticate both parties, right. uh, the person putting it in, putting it out. It's, it's, it's an yeah. intranet environment yes. where you can assume that security association. Yeah, yeah. okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, on div, um, I fixed the examples. We had some temp examples in there that uh, really needed to be repaired. Uh, they are hopefully now correct. They are hot from a actual implementation that hopefully is working. There's a bit more discipline in JSON language. This is something uh, Adam pointed out that there was really sloppy usages of like what arrays and values and elements and things like that were. So I tried to put in stricter language that is correct to how you're supposed to talk about JSON. And uh, Adam also pointed out that the language about how many divs you need per redirection in these cases where you have kind of multiple baseline divs in a single passport. For example, I know Martin's gonna talk about RPH. If you have one RPH passport, one shaken passport that are in the same, uh, you know, invite, 
um, you want to make sure that you don't end up having like exponential mul multiplication of these if you go through multiple redirections. And so the language is hopefully clear now that there will be one non-div passport um, for you know each baseline passport without a common origin dest in the message. That may be a lot to unpack when I actually say it, but the language in the draft I think is clear about this and no longer suggests this is an exponential multiplication problem. And I think that resolves the issues as Adam saw them um, of the major ones, I hope. So uh, let me know if there's anything more there. I did also, and I don't have this on the slide, I know there's been some concern in Addis that because of like attended transfer sorts of use cases, we should make the window uh, more generous for passport expiry in these div cases. Um, and these are cases where we're using like like third party call control or something like that, where you know you you put a call in to someone and and you're basically parked talk to an, to an agent and then that agent three PCCs you out to another party, but wants to reuse the original passport that you used to call that agent at the start. Um, so there's some guidance in there now that suggests, yeah, in these cases, if you have a trust relationship between ultimately the, the transfer target and the transferring entity, it's probably safe to treat, have a little bit more flexibility about like how old the original passport was that uh, entered into the call. Martin. Oh, Martin Dolly, at and um, Well, an example of that is in support of 911 for transfer, where you, know, you end up at an agent that agent stays on the call and then forwards the original signing to the, the ultimate destination um, for verification there. So there's an example of sure. some type of relay type function. Sure. I mean, of course, the, these problems all go away if you use refer instead of through PC, which would be great. But here we are, and it's 2020 in a few weeks, and we still aren't really using refer the way we're supposed to. So um, given that that seems to be the situation and there's nothing we can do about it, um, I relax that interval and you, you can be more generous with kind of stale passports for that. Next slide. Oh yeah, I seem to have a slide about this every time. Um, so I did send a note to the list a couple weeks ago talking about whether we should bother to errata um, AD224. <laughs> over this issue of whether you need quote marks around the PPT values in the identity header parameter. Um, this is something that I'll admit the text in H224 is not particularly helpful. And um, we have baked into, however, the RPH draft and the div draft doing this with quotes around the values for PPT. This has induced me at least to be like, let's make it firmly crooked that way. And um, you know, I, I think the the mailing list traffic about this, I got like three responses and it was, I think it was like two or like, yeah, I just quote it. And one was like, nah, don't quote it. If anybody else wants to like find that thread and reply and say like what they want, that would be helpful. And I would then be happy to errata this to whatever people want, but I really didn't feel like there was enough like consensus around what we should actually do. This is Chris. Um, I probably can't adequately uh, recall what the comment was, but I, I did get some comments internally that were sort of saying the ABNF in 3261 don't allow for quotes. Um, I don't know if David recalls that and maybe can make a better comment than I can. But well, that, uh, that, that, that would be a factor, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Is that true? Did the ABNF of uh, 3261 preclude having parameters in SIP be quoted? You did the ABNF, Brian. Do you remember? I did the ABNF. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> look it up, please. I'm just curious. You know, we've got a, a few minutes here, so feel free to look it up. Cullen has a comment while we're getting down to it. I, I don't. I mean, doesn't this problem go back to you know, forty-four twenty-four? Um, does it? Look, I don't know. I have the vague memory it does, and if it does, you you can't break everything that's been done since two thousand and six. Like you've got to leave it like it is. You mean forty-four seventy-four? Sorry, forty-four seventy-four. Um, well, no, but we, we're, we're not, I think, really constrained by what people did in 4474. I mean, okay. I, I, I'm sure it does, right? I'm sure that that's exactly why it's this way, because we did something like in 2006 and we're, we just cloned it for this, but. But it means that every, I mean, given this replaces, not updates that, it means like 
you can't have everybody that's producing those identities with that hasn't upgraded to the latest. I mean, you, you have to have backwards compatible at some level with that, or you're going to break every identity on every of these things, and it'll be a hundred percent reason why every vendor will go. We're not deploying that because it breaks our stuff. Like, yeah. it'll be the excuse we all need not to. I do know it. it'll be the, all the SPC vendors who will be like, "Wait, I like was compliant with this way that identity worked, and like PPT. Well, we didn't have PPT, and it's Port worse than that. You, you, you're, you're, I mean, it, it, I'm not sure this is a problem, but I mean, if it, okay. it comes up that every sing, as soon as you turn this on, one of as soon as you install one new SPC, every one of my old phones displays the identity of the call is broken with a well, broken I mean, lock icon. Like people will turn it off. I'll tell you, this is this is absolutely the number one thing from interoperability testing that is a problem, is that some people are doing it quoted, some people are doing it unquoted, and there are apparently some implementations that just refuse to accept quoted and like, you know, even though like that's what we wrote into the div and the uh, RPH specs. It's like in the examples, it's like you know, every and everything in there. And so yeah, if we're if we're gonna change this, we should change it now and then fix it in div. So that it's not quoted because right now it's quoted, <laughs> right? So Brian, do you have a verdict for us on? Double quotes are allowed. Okay. Oh really? Well, we don't escape them. <laughs> In a, a parameter, a header parameter. Yeah. I think we do too. I think we do too. Okay. I mean, here, here's my real point. I think we need some consensus around this. We, I know we took a hum about this like last year and it, we all agreed we we're going to do this quoted. And then like everybody keeps freaking out about, you know, but the ABNF that's in A224 doesn't look like it works that way. And like if, as long as there is an agreement, we're going to do it quoted, we'll errata it, right? But I mean, I'm tr I've been trying to build enough of a consensus that it is worth doing in errata. Yeah, we have a bunch of remote people. Please use the mic. So, uh, so with this, um, I'm saying that one and a half years back, I think we did that harm. And, and it, you know, for RBI, I can tell that it was not coded, then we put that uh, coded. So. so my inclination would be to errata this, provided it is not illegal in RC 36 to 1 to say that these things are supposed to be quoted, just because we've already baked it into RPH, which is already out, right? So we'd be errating that too if we're going to reverse it. And like, Right. Adam Roach, and this is just as an individual contributor. When I think about the way that we want to address this, and this sort of came up when you're talking about the interop issues that people are concretely encountering, I think we probably want something a little more complex than we could do in just a simple errata. Hmm. What we might want is a very short document that says when you generate these, put quotes around it. When you receive them, you need to be able to handle both. Well, and that's what every, that's what we're advising implementers to do in the field is that. So yes. Right. So if that's what we want people okay. to do, then we want to formalize yeah, that. And yeah. I think that probably goes well beyond the spirit of what errata are supposed to represent. Okay. Okay. We can, we can find an indication. So to you're do that. calling for an update? You're calling for an I'm update? calling for like a, a one page so, updates document. So we'll do it. Again, provided that no nobody's gonna come and say, well, but it should be unquoted, man. Like right. and, well, and what's nice about that is it gives us a lot more we know what the process is for taking an internet draft and pushing it out the door. And it's going to make this a lot less okay. fiddly than what well, we did talk about. We want Narada and then it falls between okay. the cracks. Actually, it's not. you're entirely correct, Mr. Roach. That is a, a excellent suggestion. It will give everyone an opportunity to speak now or forever hold their peace and like we'll pass it as a consensus document. Sold. Next slide. I mean, there's much more. I hear OB is coming soon to a telechat near you. Um, you know, I think we do now that we have the framework and architecture for OOB out. I suspect there will be some new documents that are going to talk about these very uh, specific use cases in which people want to use OOB. There's the public option. I've heard a lot of people interested in trying to figure out how to do public OOB. And public OB is really cool, and it could be meaningful for a number of solutions um, out there in the universe. I am not going to do all this work myself, um, especially not on the public option. But uh, if there is a will to get those things done, then I, I will certainly pitch in. 
Um, the private option is the one that I think is more interesting as kind of what some of these more enterprise-ish use cases look like. Maybe the enterprise is interacting with that smartphone app, things like that. Um, those I think are because they are practically starting to appear in the field now, this is not hypothetical. <laughs> um, we probably do have enough data to standardize something narrow about what the guidance should be for that use case, which we did not have when we were building this framework and architecture. So I'd expect we'll probably at least see that one um, coming down the pike relatively soon. Anything else people want to say about this? Any more we should be? I just have one question. Where is that update going to be processed? This doesn't seem like the right place. The update to AD224? On I, Adam's. <laughs> you want an AD sponsored, Adam? Adam Roach. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is if we think we can get this out the door by March, I'm happy to go ahead and try to push it forward. Um, right. And I obviously could hand it off after that. But ideally, we'd have it done, you know, before I'm gone. Yeah, I mean, again, if it's a one-page document, and then, you know, we can just pump it out. So you'll have it done by the end of the week? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Russ. Um, do you have any more? I don't think I do. Any more slides? I think I'm good. Okay. So it seems like the next step got added during the discussion was yeah. my point. Okay. Let, let the minutes reflect, <laughs> minute taker, that... Okay. John, did you you talked about divert as well already, right? Yes. It was one slide deck. That's what I remembered. Okay, Martin, you're up. <laughs> okay, um, the uh, Nina ESIF community, um, you know, made a request of the IPNNI for uh, signing of the RPH for uh, civil 911 calls for ESINet. Uh, similarly uh, to what we did for government priority services, um, ETS, WPS. And so, um, next slide. Okay, so um, in the, uh, the, the, original, the, the first signing RPH for government priority services, um, we uh, built upon uh, the 2082-25 uh, uh, for inclusion of a, a cryptographically signed um, RPH um, header field. Um, there, a, a registry was created um, so that um, additional New assertions would be um, easier for standardization within IANA. And so what this document here is provides new assertions for emergency services call origination and emergency services callback. And so the new assertion values are ES org for the emergency services origination and ES callback for emergency services uh, callback. Um, we had a conversation at the last IPNNI meeting, so the example I gave at the mic, um, where you, you make a, an emergency services call, you end up at an emergency service uh, uh, operator, uh, but then needs to transfer you. And when they transfer you, it's not a hard transfer. They stay on the call and it's more like a conference. And uh, so we talked about do we need a uh, new assertion for that and the answer would be no because the original signing of the passport would be passed along uh, during that transport process. Okay. And so that's the reason for not requesting a, 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 a one for the, for the transport case. 
Uh, next slide. And so um, the syntax that we're proposing is um, for the orig, the um, orig TN calling party number. Now here's something where this can be either 911 or a URN, a uh, service URN as in URN SOS. Yeah, John Peterson, uh, we need to fix that. Yeah, so that you can actually have that URN in there. This is another like short draft that somebody needs to do. Well, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily looking at you. you. We've talked about this before. Yes, I'm aware that there, there's a little bit of crufty text in 8224 that seems to imply this can really, it has to be like a SIP or SIP S URL or whatever, basically. So yes, we will, we will patch something. Now, you're welcome to do it in this draft if you want, to be honest. But I, I would be fine if somebody wants yeah, to take yeah. some existing draft and just have a section in there that says, by the way, this updates RFC 8224 to say that it's okay to put like an SOS URN into uh, the, you know, the S field. I, I happy to help write text for that. <laughs> we, had, we actually had a discussion about a related topic. I don't know, Martin, if you want to talk about that now or later. The the fact that um, you know for uh, cell phones that don't have SIM cards in them, you still need to support nine one one, and there's no telephone number associated. So, what do you do for Orich um, when there's no telephone number and I was wondering, is there something that can represent a known, like a URN or something like that, or should we make something up or uh, curious? Uh, Brian Rosen, you, you want an ID, not just unknown. It doesn't have to be a telephone number, but there needs to be some other that was ID. that was part of the that was part of the discussion that we had in IPN and I, Brian. That there would be there there would there would be something that would syntactically mean, you know, it's, it's not that it's anonymous, um, but th that the originating carrier can't verify the identity of the origination originator of the call. Um, like it. So do you, I guess my question is, do you want something like an IMSI or IMEI that actually is uniquely identifiable? You just want something that says like, it's okay that I vouch for this person. I heard Martin say you, he can't vouch for the person. You, you, you can't vouch for the person, but you can vouch for the device, which is all you ever right. device, vouch for. All, all, the, all, the, all the emergency services guys care about is that two calls at the same from the same uninitialized phone have the same identifier. Okay, That's all but, they care about. Okay, so let's let's take a step back. Under what does you know and, what, and, what do you, and why do you think you know it? Um, this is not your subscriber. So you have no knowledge of their IMEI or any identifier whatsoever. Yeah, yeah they have to associate it with the GSM network, whatever, right? Or it's CMA network. And so there's the low level network identifier that they utilize that's unique in order so that you can like signal the radio, right? I mean. The device knows that. The service provider network doesn't know doesn't that. Doesn't know that. Yeah, but but I think that's okay, right? We're just saying that you need some unique identifier that I guess, would that be used for callback or? No, it's not used for callback. It's for call origination. Yeah, it's for origination it's only. Right. It's just to identify the two calls from the same phone are are the, from the same phone. So all they care about is that, it is that we know that they're from the same phone. Correct. You, you don't know anything else. So, so in other words, if we created or, or just maybe we can reuse some existing like URN, right, that just contains yeah. some, just, just a UID of some kind yes. right. that is yeah. gonna be created by the service providers, that would be sufficient for this function, okay. Yes. But let's so let's just figure out exactly what that URN should be. I'm sure there's something we can reuse for this. Um, so we does so for the callback for the same phone. That is it. That then um, the operator will ask that a callback number. No, no. So basically, for callback is um, you make a call, but for whatever reason you get disconnected, right. and so now the emergency network is calling you back. Right. Okay. So, like, if you dial nine one one and hang up, right? The and, and then you actually got to the to the PSAP. The PSAP's going to call you back, and that's what we're, that's what we're referring to as callback here. Correct. But the 
I think I agree with uh, what Chris mentioned, right? If I have no uh, phone number associated with my uh, device, right? I do not have a subscription, then no. I make the call. Then how do I get the call back? There's a there's an identifier. Okay, there's a node, and and I'll let I'll let Brian speak to it. He knows the architecture better than I do. Uh, Brian Rosen. So, at, at least at the moment, and I don't think the carriers are promising anything new. You can't call back in an uninitialized right. device, and I don't think anybody's asking for that. I don't think the network can do that. Right. Um, so that isn't. It doesn't matter. You can't call it back. Okay. Okay, and that is it. Thank you. So, um, is this a document that people want to adopt? And obviously, we'll take it to the list, regardless of the answer in this room. But go ahead. Yeah, John Peterson. Yes, I, I think it is. And you know, my only question about it is, we've talked about a couple of other things. It sounds like it might be useful to specify along with this. Right. Do we kind of need a STIR working group document that is how to do STIR for emergency services that contains this and that stuff, every, all the different URN stuff we need to do? And like, because it just seems like there's a bucket of stuff that needs to be done. Or do you just want to kind of do this alone and have another document that is going to specify, okay, here's where your SOS lives, uh, and why, how that should work with DAST and things like that? That's so, really a question for Martin in terms of just how you want to organize this. I, I think there's a follow-up question, which is, are there other places that the URN SOS would appear than just a passport? Yeah, so that it exists, and there's specification already for how to use your SOS and like that's baseline. That's what I set. thought. So, yeah. uh, so, so I mean, so the point is, this is just specifying what the procedure. Like, there may be unique AS and VS procedures that are associated with receiving a call for your SOS, right? And like, I mean, I I had to write them for div. I had to write them for OOB. Like, and I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't something unique about the way this was supposed to work. And some of the things we've just been talking about suggest to me that there probably is. So I guess my question is, do we want a more kind of general document that talks about how we're going to deal with emergency services situations and stir, you know, or do we kind of just want to do this tactically and assume that, that then some other document will reference this where it actually describes more of like how you do emergency services overall? Uh, Brian Rosen, just to be clear, the URN typically is not in two. It's typically in, well, doesn't matter what's in two. What matters is in the request URI. That's where it is, the request URI. Um, just one more thing to note. And so um, this doesn't come look like it's going to come seri uh, seriously in serial form. Um, the other uh, namespaces uh, in, our, in the RPH name, one is for, I think there's three, there's there's two defined for mission critical push to talk, which is the responder. So in the U.S. that would be for FirstNet, um, and uh, I've been trying to reach out to see if they would want, um, uh, you know, signing of RPH for for their calls, and I haven't gotten a, a positive answer. And the examples there would be um, there's a Katrina event. And someone is calling uh, uh, from the event to Washington uh, to FEMA, as an example. Now, they may also be a GETS WPS user, which would likely be the signing that could occur, but they may they don't necessarily have to be, and and therefore, you know, what, do they want priority handling for those calls? Brian Rosen, I, I, no, being involved with this particular set of folks involved in FirstNet, and they don't have a clue. And, I, and, and your inclination here is 100% correct. Of course they want to have this. Great. Yes, we're going to have to do this. Probably also going to have to do the DOD one. And, and the other, and there's a whole set for DOD. For sure. Yeah, there's a, there's a meeting in January with MITRE, and I'm going to, I'm going to be talking on 5G security. And I'll bring that up there to see what they say. So my intuition is that this um, could go first 
and all that other stuff needs to be sorted out and could come later just to not to get the parts we know are stable done does does anyone see it differently okay thank you thank you we appreciate the time all right we're at the any other business part of the agenda is there any Okay, so uh, two decisions were that we're going to uh, have a working group last call on delegated certs after the new year, and we're going to have a call for adoption of the document that Martin just briefed. All right. I'll, I'll say one more thing to John Peterson, which is like um, now that delegation and OB are wrapping up in addition to doing future OB stuff, one thing that I am hearing more about in the industry that I feel probably does need to come back is connected identity actually. Um, this is something that we floated an initial draft about um, like a year or so ago, but hasn't been on the front burner. But these are all the use cases where you want to try to figure out when you're placing a call who you've actually reached. And to be able to use stir in the backwards direction rather than the forwards direction. And there are a couple of variations on this, including doing uh, pre-call stir checks of various kinds. If you have a telephone number that you know you're about to call that you can see in a UI, actually be able to see like RCD data associated with who it is you're calling before you press call and to know that it's secure, things like that. Um, this, this is something that is already hinted at in the connected identity draft that was submitted like a year or so ago. Um, this is something that I'm hearing some more pressure from in the marketplace, so that will probably come back next time. Thank you. Have a good week.